Hello, everybody. We're going to give it just a couple minutes for everyone to join and then the presentation will start. Thank you so much for joining. I welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're giving it just one more minute for uh, more people to join us and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this is our first session of the 2020 Old Line uh, State Summit. Um, and thank you so much for our, to our speakers for being with us for this inaugural session. My name is Jessica Felt. I'm the Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Maryland. Um, today's session will be the first in a series presented all the way through the fall on a variety of topics, including retrofitting suburban communities, uh, creation of conservation districts, increasing participation in the planning process, among others. Um, so we hope you will join us for these, uh, starting with the next session, which is till July 20th. Um, and so for the anniversary of the moon landing, we'll present a session on preservation of the lunar landing site, featuring Michelle Hanlon, who is the co-founder and president of For All Moonkind, and uh, Tizel Muir Harmony, who is a curator at the National Air and Space Museum. So registration is available on our website, uh, preservationmaryland.org. And actually, I also have a link in the chat um, to that, along with some other links uh, relevant to the session today. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for support of this program. Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisengrant, uh, Brandon and & Company, and the Minidor Foundation. Um, our sponsors, along with support from members and donors, make it possible to present these sessions free of charge, and we really greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, today's session, Historic Preservation, Self-Preservation, is presented in partnership with the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture, 
We are delighted to welcome Chanel Compton, Executive Director of the Banneker Douglas Museum and the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, along with Reggie Turner, who is the founder and president of Turner Wealth Management and is a commissioner on the commission. Uh, thank you so much both for being here. Um, we're gonna start today by hearing from Chanel Compton on the history and work of the Maryland Commission. Um, before her current position, she was the executive director of the Prince George's County African American Museum and the education director for the Creative Alliance in Baltimore. She has a bachelor's degree from Rutgers University and a graduate degree from American University. She serves on several boards, including Afro Charities, Future History Now, and serves as the board chair of the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. Next, we'll hear from Reggie Turner on how the commission's goals and mission is expressed in an individual project, the work on Jonathan Street, the heart of a historic African-American neighborhood in Hagerstown. This is a project Preservation Maryland is proud to be a part of, having recently purchased Fort 17 North Jonathan Street as part of our relaunched historic property redevelopment program. Reggie has been a financial advisor for 20 years and is a graduate of Mount St. Mary's University. Prior to founding Turner Wealth Management, he spent his career as an advisor for a Wall Street wealth management firm and two Fortune 500 banks as a vice president. He has also served as an advisor for several historically black colleges and university investment clubs and presents seminars to major corporations along with mentoring children's groups on the basics of investing. In addition to serving on the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, he serves on the Western Maryland Advisory Committee of the Maryland Civil Rights Commission, Commission and the board of the Washington County Historical Society among other boards. So thank you both Chanel and Reggie for joining us. Um, before we start, we do have a place to post questions, um, and we do encourage you to post your questions in the question box. Um, at the end of the presentations, we will go back and take a look at some of those questions and um, hear from Chanel and Reggie on those questions. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand this over to Chanel. No, whenever you're ready, here she comes. All right, I am ready. Thank you, Jessica. I'm gonna pull up the presentation, there you go. All right, well, greetings, everyone. Um, I will be leading a presentation on the work and impact of the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture um, as a national model of historical preservation. Uh, the commission is the first state ethnic uh, first state ethnic commission in the nation. We were founded in 1969, and we are the only African-American state commission uh, in the nation that uh, operates the uh, state's museum, which is the Banneker Douglas Museum, as well as the state's $1 million African-American Heritage Preservation Grant in partnership with MHT. So next slide. So today we'll be talking about our mission, our founders, the Banneker Douglas Museum, the African American Heritage Preservation Grant Program, uh, and our community and our current community partnerships and work. Uh, so the mission of the museum, it, I'm sorry, the mission of the commission <laughs> is uh, we are committed to discovering, documenting, preserving, collecting, and promoting Maryland's African American heritage. The commission also provides technical assistance to institutions and groups with similar objectives. And through this mission, the commission seeks to educate Maryland citizens and our visitors uh, to our state about the significance of African American, of the African American experience in Maryland. So we have a very um, compelling and statewide mission in, uh, throughout the state. And next slide. So a little bit about our founder. So the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture was founded in 1969. And it was led, the legislation was led by Senator Verda Freeman Welcome. And she built that legislation in collaboration with Professor Benjamin Quarles. Uh, Senator Verda Freeman Welcome was the first ever African-American woman state senator. Uh, she spent 75 years in, in the Maryland legislature and worked to pass legislation 
which enforced stricter employment regulations and discouraged racial discrimination. So thinking back, I wasn't here in 1969, but some, some folks in the audience may have been. Uh, 1969 was a year after King's assassination, uh, and there were uprisings not only in Maryland, but all throughout the nation. Uh, and so uh, Senator uh, Welcome's vision, along with Benjamin Quarles, was to create a commission who would be charged with authentically preserving and presenting African-American history art and culture to Maryland citizens, because how can you really hate someone if you know their history and culture? And even looking back at the early documentation and legislation um, to push the commission forward, as well as the Banneker Douglas Museum, you see a lot of words like um, 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 to fight discrimination, to fight for equity. So this, so the commission, in essence, was an act of social justice. Uh, professor Benjamin Quarles, he was a Morgan State professor. Uh, he um, wrote incredible works about Frederick Douglass. He was a student of Benjamin Quarles. I'm sorry, he was a student of Carter G. Woodson, who is known as the father of Black History Month and um, really set the tone for solidifying African-American scholarship in this country. Uh, so Quarles was a student of his. And so um, a lot, him along with uh, Senator Welcome um, really um, through their vision, through their social uh, justice activism and scholarship um, really set the tone for African American uh, African American preservation in Maryland. Next slide. So I love this picture. <laughs> this is uh, an early photo of the commission. Uh, you see Senator uh, Welcome right in the middle there, um, and right to the far left of the screen is Carol Green, who was actually the first um, museum director for the Banneker Douglas Museum. So how did the Banneker Douglas Museum come to be? Because the commission was legislated in 1969, but the museum didn't open until 1984. And I'm, I'll share that information in the next slide. <laughs> All right, so the Banneker Douglas Museum is Maryland's state official museum on African American history and culture. Uh, we're located in the heart of downtown Annapolis, uh, and the museum is actually a national preservation site. So if you looked at the, le at the left screen, uh, side of the screen, it's a photo of um, what was once Mount Moriah AME Church. Uh, this church was built in 1874, and the congregation actually dates back to 1799. Um, up until the 70s, the uh, congregation sold the church to the county uh, because they had outgrew the facility, uh, and the county wanted to tear it down uh, to convert the church into a parking lot. Um, but the church meant so much more, not only to the folks that actually were members of the church, but to the greater African-American community, because this was the site and the epicenter of um, um, uh, uh, Black culture, um, um, faith, uh, civic engagement within an, for African Americans in Annapolis. So it meant, meant a great deal. So to see it torn down um, was a travesty. And this was actually one of the major um, African American preservation initiatives for the commission, because at that point, the commission had been operating for a few years. Um, it had already built um, a collection of African-American artifacts. Um, so um, it had uh, stature, uh, so to speak. So the commission, along with community members, advocated to save Mount Moriah. Uh, next slide. Uh, so you see Carol Green, he's talking um, with some um, staff uh, or some individuals, fellow um, advocates for Mount Moriah. Um, they had the Save Mount Moriah Church Initiative uh, along with the commission. Uh, next slide. 
and this is just such a stellar uh, a photograph. So this was what Mount Moriah looked like. Um, uh, excuse me. My Alexa. Running, running havoc. All right. So uh, the. So in this photo, you see Senator of uh, uh, Welcome. You see Carol Green looking up at the church. And Carol Green, he was um, he worked at the Smithsonian uh, and actually coordinated one of their folk life festivals. And he had a museum curatorial experience. And so Saving Mount Moriah, the goal for the commission as well, the initial goal for the commission and community members was to turn Mount Moriah into a national preservation site. And it was Carol Green, and you can kind of even imagine that he was thinking this in the photo. Um, he saw the church as a repository for African American history and culture, um, as a, a future museum. So uh, the church was, so the commission and community members, they actually uh, went to court. Um, against the county um, to convert the museum into a national preservation site, and they won. Uh, and in 1984, it opened as the Banneker Douglas Museum. So this is what the Banneker Douglas looks like today. Uh, so Mount Moriah Church um, is being currently, what was once Mount Moriah Church uh, is currently used as an exhibit space, um, as well as a performance art space. And on this side um, of the facility that you see in the photos is our modern wing, which was built in 2006, 2006 to 2008, uh, excuse me. Uh, and so, the facility is about 11,000 square feet. Uh, we have exhibitions, uh, community programs, and so much more, and roughly 12,000 visitors. And so when you think of the Banneker Douglas Museum, this museum wasn't established in a vacuum, right? Um, this uh, um, facility was a part of the greater Black museums movement. So right in the late 70s to the 90s, you saw a rise of African American museums and cultural institutions being opened throughout the nation, right? And so this was post-Black power civil rights movement. So the same activists um, uh, and leaders such as Verda uh, Freeman Welcome, um, HBCU scholars such as Benjamin Quarles, community leaders, um, and so forth, uh, created these institutions as a way of community building, as a way of authentically preserving African American heritage um, and culture, which weren't expressed and to this day still isn't fully expressed in our public school history books in the mainstream and so forth. This was a part of um, the greater African American social justice movement in this nation and the Banneker Douglas Museum is a product of that. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the interior of our permanent exhibit, Deep Roots Rising Water, uh, and this is a, a family uh, going through this ex exhibit. I think this is a great picture because our exhibitions um, uh, uh, is a family-friendly, um, interactive experience where uh, people of all ages can get a snapshot on the African American experiences in um, in Maryland from Matthias de Sousa, Benjamin Banneker, who of course is our namesake, Frederick Douglass, um, the different um, trades of of the African American enslaved as well as free labor force in Maryland, um, African Americans. Uh, presence in, in um, um, uh, uh, national conflicts and, um, and education and so forth. So it's a really great um, experience for the entire family. Next slide. So our work at the Banneker Douglas Museum, um, along with the commission, uh, we have the commission is about 21 seats of um, individuals that represent a 
vast majority of the counties in Maryland, um, and they range from um, um, activists, lawyers, scholars, community leaders, and so forth. Uh, they partner with the BDM staff to implement um, numerous programs, such as um, the our community programs. We have an annual community day celebration. We have teacher trainings that are, are just stellar and incredibly timely. Um, our teacher training for this summer, we'll focus on anti-racism, facilitating conversations around anti-racism in the classroom. Um, we have an after-school program annually every year. Uh, we have our upcoming youth conference, which will focus on um, the Black vote. We have lectures and discussions, uh, special events, tours, and collections, and of course, our collections and archives. And I'm proud to say, um, that uh, we were awarded an IMLS grant to uh, upgrade our collections facility, uh, which completely, I don't have any photos of it, but when our museum opens back up, uh, we will be giving tours. It's an incredible facility. Um, that we look forward to sharing with the public. So speaking of our museum opening, uh, we don't have an opening date as of yet when we'll be open to the public, but we do have a um, virtual program series um, that we have just rolled out um, with virtual programs um, on teacher training workshops. Uh, we have our youth conference and a symposium coming up soon. Next slide. So our current exhibition that will be a virtual experience is the Black Boat Mural Project at the Banneker Douglas Museum. Uh, next slide. So uh, right before the pandemic, uh, we invited 17 uh, regional muralists to paint murals around the theme of the Black Boat, um, African Americans and the boat. Uh, so this year is the sesquicentennial of the 15th Amendment uh, that allowed African American men to cast their vote, as well as the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage movement that uh, gave women the right to vote. Uh, so this ex exhibition focuses on just that, the Black vote and the history of the Black vote from African American women's suffrage, suffragists, um, to um, the civil rights movement, to Black Lives Matter, and so forth. So there's a, a wide breadth of interpretations at the Banneker Douglas Museum. Uh, the murals are just incredible. If you'd like to learn more about our murals, you can follow us on our social media as well. So the African American Heritage Preservation Grant Workshop, uh, this is an annual grant program. We're actually just hit our 10th year anniversary. Uh, and again, um, this, uh, Af this grant program um, was actually the brainchild of our past uh, commission chair. He's currently the chair emer emeritus, Theodore Mack. Uh, and so when he was chair, uh, he met with elected officials and community members um, to develop a grant program in partnership with MHT that would offer greater equity when it comes to historical preservation in Maryland because uh, um, you know, um, a very small percentage of heritage sites, African-American heritage sites were actually getting state funding for capital repair. Uh, and so, this was an incredible call to action um, for the state of Maryland. Uh, the grant was legislated in perpetuity in 2010. Uh, and because of this grant program, over a hundred African American heritage projects, um, capital projects were funded. Uh, so many um, African American heritage sites, such as Rosenwald schoolhouses, historic churches, museums, uh, community centers, um, historic homes and the like would have either um, closed or suffered major disrepair. Um, the uh, grant um, deadline unfortunately passed. It was July 1st, uh, but stay tuned. We have another round coming up in 2021. Uh, and again, uh, the grant deadline is typically July 1st. Next slide. 
So eligible activities for this project is acquisition, so purchasing property, rehabilitation, new construction, and pre-development as part of a capital project. I think it's also important to note that nonprofits do not need a match for this program, um, which of course, because of that, this is an incredibly competitive um, uh, grant program, um, but such a great opportunity because with this grant award, many of our applicants are able to leverage more funding um, uh, to support uh, their site. Next slide. So these are some photos of the different um, types of sites um, that have applied. So you have AME churches, you have one room schoolhouses. On the right hand corner, you have um, Baby D's, which is soon to be open this summer in Prince George's County. Uh, it was once a juke joint. And uh, if you see a, the sign in front, um, that's an illustration of Duke Ellington. He had once uh, played there, Pearl Bailey. Um, so all the folks that would play um, in the black music mecca of Washington DC on U Street will come to, to uh, Baby D's as almost like an after party spot, right? And, and so the town of North Brentwood, which is a historically black township, uh, is converting this into a community art center for the town uh, in the Gateway Arts District. So we're really proud of, of that project. Next slide. slide. And these, this is a really great map. Um, so since 2010, um, this program has awarded close to $10 million um, dollars, um, to, oops, excuse me, I lost the, up oh, to about 115 preservation projects throughout Maryland. Um, there are some counties that have yet to apply for the, or to have yet to have received funding, but uh, we are working on it. Our goal is for the, uh, this grant program to reach all counties uh, in Maryland. Our next slide. So this is a more contemporary photo of um, our commission. Uh, um, a few of the folks in the back row um, are actually staffers um, at, I believe, U University of Maryland, UMBC. Uh, but for the most part, this is our commission. Uh, and again, it's 21 seats and we do tremendous work. And you can see Reggie Turner, who'll be speaking later um, on his work in Hagerstown. But I tell you, if you ever get a chance to come to or sit in on uh, our public meetings, um, this year, of course, many of which will be virtual, it's literally a history lesson. I mean, you learn so much about um, uh, different um, uh, African American heritage projects in Maryland, different initiatives and causes. It's really, excuse me, <coughs> incredible. Um, Oh, excuse me, allergies um, uh, to participate in. So our commission meetings are bi-monthly and you can uh, learn more about that on our website at africanamerican.maryland.gov. Next slide. So as an act of solidarity, uh, currently the commission uh, uh, put out a statement. Um, and, and I think it's important to note that when you're, when you're thinking of um, the, Af our, the Maryland African American um, uh, History and Culture Commission, as well as the, the work of the Banneker Douglas Museum, our mission is to uh, preserve and present and celebrate African American history and civil rights is a um, critical and important part of our history, right? Uh, so if you think of civil rights in this country, um, it was born out of the anti-slavery movement. The women's suffrage movement was born out of the anti-slavery slavery movement. Um, the civil rights that we enjoy today was born out of the civil rights movement. Uh, and so the commission is taking an active role of recognizing this new wave of civil rights in this country. Uh, so we currently put out a, state, uh, a statement 
honoring the lives of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, um, uh, and to uh, document and to share our concerns over police brutality and systemic racism, and also document the work of community leaders, of scholars and artists that are actively taking part in this movement today. So there's a statement, and I encourage you all to take a moment and read that. Uh, and this is currently on our website as well. All right, next slide. So this is our uh, current community project uh, with the city of Annapolis and Future History Now. Uh, the Maryland Commission, so Future History Now was one of the exhibitors to um, the Black Folk Mural Project exhibit, and they are a local private nonprofit, a very small nonprofit in Annapolis that focuses on public art and um, by way um, public art as a tool for community building. And so they partnered with the commission to um, advocate for the city to present this mural, as well as to, to fundraise for the supplies um, for this actual project and the implementation. So we literally did this in two and a half weeks um, from the ground up. This was a true grassroots effort. Um, over 200 people uh, came on July 4th weekend throughout the state. Um, this is located in Chambers Park, which was once an historic African American community. Uh, and uh, community members and state folks from throughout, actually we have people from New York and Philadelphia came to install this mural in honor of Breonna Taylor uh, and the Black Lives Matter uh, civil rights movement. Uh, it was an incredible day as her Breonna Taylor story has touched the hearts and um, minds and spirits of not only, of course, individuals in Kentucky, but her story rings true to, um, to Black communities in Maryland uh, and through throughout the nation and even throughout the globe. Uh, and so this was a very timely initiative and we were really happy uh, and honored to be a part of it, but there's definitely more work uh, to be done. Uh, next slide. So thank you so much. Um, as you can see, uh, the commission um, comes from a long line of um, civil rights activists um, and, um, uh, and scholarship. Our mission is statewide. We are uh, a national model of African American historic preservation, uh, but also in doing that preservation work, we're also active in the community um, and engaging conversations around um, Black um, social justice matters and, and movements. So, you know, we think about our current founders uh, from Senator Verda Freeman Welcome and uh, uh, Professor Benjamin Quarles of Morgan State University and our, um, our first uh, executive director, Carol Green. And we think to ourselves, would they be proud of us today? And I'm proud to say, I believe they would be. Uh, so thank you so much for, for your time. And I will turn it over to um, Jessica, uh, who I believe will turn it over to Reggie. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the commission and the Banneker Douglas Museum, you can go to the Banneker Douglas Museum's website at bdmuseum.maryland.gov or the commission's website at africanamerican.maryland.gov. Uh, we are active daily on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter because uh, we have stellar events that are both virtual uh, and hopefully quite soon on site. So thank you so much for all of your time. Thank you so much, Janelle. And yes, we will now be turning this over um, to Reggie uh, to talk a little bit about his work in Hankerstown in the John Curry Project. Thank you, Jessica.
this is a picture of a sign that's in the historic Jonathan Street community. And the Jonathan Street community is located within the city limits of, of Hagerstown uh, here in Western Maryland. Uh, in 2017, when Governor Hogan appointed me uh, to the Maryland Commission of African American History and Culture, I became the first uh, commissioner in Washington County in the 50-year history of the commission, which was really exciting to me um, to be able to serve and also from a historical standpoint. Um, I had spent four years before as the president of the Dolman Black Heritage Museum, so it was natural to me to dive right into the history and begin advocating for uh, this historic Black community. You can go to the next slide now. Thank you. Uh, this is a picture of uh, 19, or excuse me, 1887 Sanborn insurance map. Uh, and in looking at uh, this map, if you look at sections three and four, going from south to north, that is roughly the area of the Jonathan Street community. Uh, this is a community where enslaved and free uh, Americans of African descent uh, had lived since the 17, late 1700s. Uh, one of the things I would like for you to recognize on this slide, if you're looking at those sections three and four, uh, if you're looking from west to east, you'll see a West Bethel Street, you'll see an East Bethel Street, you'll see a West Church Street and an East Church Street. Um, as we go to the next slide, it's going to be important for you to understand some of the context of that community and how policies have shaped how this community has been redlined. You can go to the next slide. This is a current Google map of looking at the community. So when you look at Bethel Street, looking at it um, from west to east, uh, what you see is Bethel Street actually turns into Randolph Street. Uh, and then if you're looking towards the bottom there where you're looking at Church Street, Church Street turns into East Street. Um, and that, in the outline that I've roughly drawn here, basically shows you the Red Line community and how names of streets were changed to to basically signify what was considered the black community where this was the only place that African Americans could live until some years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So within the city of Hagerstown, the closer and closer um, that we got towards the Civil War, African Americans that were living in the county were kind of herded into the small uh, section of community here within the city. Next slide. In regards to its historic value, there are many things that we can talk about in regards to the Jonathan Street community in regards to its historic significance. Um, we could talk about things such as when Frederick Douglass visited Hagerstown in 1879. You know, we could also speak to the AME Ebenezer Church here uh, that's on Bethel Street uh, that was founded in 1820, only four years after the Richard Allen founded the um, the AME Church um, in Philadelphia. Uh, but also we have Green Book sites. Uh, this is the 1950 Green Book. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide. So if you see there towards the bottom in Hagerstown, there were two sites in Hagerstown that were a part of the Green Book. You had the Harmon Hotel that was owned by Walter Harmon, who was the most affluent uh, African-American in the community. And then also you had Ship's Tea Room. Unfortunately, both of those sites no longer exist. Uh, both have been long since demolished. Uh, the only thing that represents the uh, Harmon Hotel is a plaque that is up in, in the community but this is a part of the rich history that has been lost uh, from the community and no longer exists where 
uh, some of the the greatest landmarks that we've had of the community are no longer there. Next slide. My true advocacy for the community started around the home on the right, the um, the house that was marked for demolished. That is 300 and 335 uh, North Jonathan Street. Uh, this particular home um, was up for demolished to be demolished. I received a call from a community resident in regards to this home, and many people in the community were unaware of the significant history of this home. This home uh, was a home that uh, the Moxley Band. And the Moxley Band is a Civil War era band um, made up of members of this community where there were three Moxley brothers and nine other members, um, some of which were free and some of which were enslaved, uh, formed this band. And this band joined the U.S. Colored Troops where many of those members gained their freedom by joining uh, the U.S. Colored Troops and became the marquee band for them. Uh, the band uh, performed in here in Maryland and Virginia uh, and as far south as, uh, as Texas, as Brownsville, Texas. And then all of those members made it back to this area uh, practicing and playing in that home and playing in Wheaton Park, one of the other uh, significant sites in, in this community. Um, subsequently, after the first Moxleys lived in this home, um, a younger Moxley that continued the band uh, lived, in, lived in this home and actually purchased and owned this home. You can move to the next slide. As we begin to advocate and talk with the city that was about to demolish this home, uh, I was able to connect with the family and learn more significance about the history. What you're seeing here is two of the drums that the family has uh, from, from the band. And the amazing thing about this band is that this band uh, had 99 years of service uh, to, to our community. And if you are looking, if you can look back to archives of the Afro-American newspaper, um, many times it was reported in regards to the significance of what the band um, meant to the community, the different types of events they were involved in. And one of the significant events that we were able to find is that this band uh, was playing as, as Frederick Douglass paraded into town. Um, they led him into town uh, with their musical wares, so which is a, another amazing discovery. Next slide. So in an effort to save this building, this is when our relationship with Preservation Maryland began. Uh, one of the things that Executive Director Nick Redding, uh, Nicholas Redding told me when we started to advocate was that be prepared that we may lose the home, but be able to win the war in regards to preserving the community. And we had a very contentious meeting with our city council uh, in regards to this home uh, and in regards to doing research, the quote that you see here, uh, we found many ways that the city of Hagerstown had neglected the Jonathan Street community um, and allowed um, a lot of, the, you know, these buildings to be in disrepair uh, without any significant work done to flesh out the history. Um, the city had performed a preservation study in 2002 where there were six recommendations given to them to partner with our city um, to um, partner with the community to be able to preserve a lot of the rich history in the community. And at the city council meeting that you're seeing a snapshot of, um, the, the sad thing is, is that we had looked over that period of time and none of those recommendations had been um, adequately fulfilled. Uh, and that was a very troubling sight uh, to us. And we were there to talk with the city and ask for their help uh, to move things forward and be able to work with us to start preserving things in this community. If you can move to the next slide.
this here is a snapshot of a Facebook post in regards to our cry out to community as we started to learn more of the history. Uh, what you'll see here is that in Hagerstown, there were four historic districts that were named between eight, 1987 and, and also uh, 1992. Uh, and the problem with that is, is that every district is accounted for within the city, except for what I'm showing here, which is the Jonathan Street community. The Jonathan Street was excluded from this process. And, and what we have contended is this has uh, significantly contributed to the deterioration of the community. And we looked at the ways that the city had disinvested in that community to the state of ill repair that it was in now. And what we realized through that process is that there was two things. We realized there were things that the city of Hagerstown were not willing to do. And we knew that there were things that they weren't capable of doing. So that, um, that precipitated uh, myself and other community members starting the Western Maryland Community Development Corporation to uh, speak to some of these issues. So if you can go to the next slide. So myself and four other community members, we have developed the Western Maryland Community Development Corporation. Um, and the acronym we like to use is, is we're here. Uh, we are here. And we're healing, empowering, revitalizing, and educating our communities. And we've anchored our flag in the Jonathan Street community as our start. But throughout Western Maryland, there are other communities that have seen similar disinvestment um, and also from a historical preservation value, um, the, the history of those communities has not been highlighted like other parts of the community has been. If you go to the next slide. This, this slide just speaks to our mission and our vision of what we are looking to accomplish uh, in the community. We incorporated the organization earlier uh, this year. Uh, we have partnered with Preservation Maryland to become our fiscal sponsor um, as we seek nonprofit status. We're in, we're in the midst of completing our business plan in regards to the community and how we will combine the original entity with, with our nonprofit um, entity and how we'll tie those things together to kind of complete our community work. And if you'll go to the next slide. So under here, healing, empowering, revitalizing, and education, uh, we, we brought together a group that we felt that we could adequately bring our expertise in different fields to uh, address these things in the community. Uh, our, our first goal of what we've been working towards right now from a preservation standpoint is we have been looking to identify and to preserve uh, all the historic structures that are still left within this community. That's been job number one. Uh, behind the scenes, we have been working on some of these other items as well. We're still engaging um, with our, um, our Maryland delegation and also our city in regards to uh, helping move our projects forward. Um, but there is still more work to be done. And if you'll go to the next slide. So at the Western Maryland CDC, you'll have me uh, I, we, I co-founded this organization with Terrence Moore. I am serving as the chairman. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll have Terrence Moore that is serving as our co-chair uh, with this organization. Terrence has extensive uh, history with project management. Uh, so we are uh, teaming up together with our other community members to move our project forward. If you move to our next slide, you will have uh, Mitchell Branch, who has been a, 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 long, a pretty long friend, a long-term friend of mine that has uh, served our military for over 20 plus years, uh, bringing his skills uh, to join us in regards to the preservation of the community. 
And if you'll go to the next slide. You'll have Scott Guillory uh, that has joined us, um, and he has spent the past uh, 12 years working with Harris Teeter, and one of the items that we were looking to address within the community is the food desert uh, that it is, and, and we're excited to have Scott on the team to bring his expertise. And then last, if you go to the next slide, You have Kenyatta Mason that has worked for many years with FedEx and is bringing his skills of logistics to the community. And just like Mitchell Branch, he is native uh, to the area. So uh, his family relationships, his, his knowledge of the history of the community and his ties to the community are, are very important for what we're seeking to do. And if you go to the next slide. So the first project that we're taking on is, is this log cabin uh, in the Jonathan Street community. Um, there's work being done to identify the age of this cabin, uh, but, but we believe that this cabin uh, is roughly, uh, was roughly built around 1823. This cabin has significant history to the community. Um, the, the homeowner that lived in this home lived into that until late um, 2018, and he has worked with us um, to sell the, the property to us to work with. And uh, through with Preservation Maryland, we've worked with him that the, the purchase of this has been uh, completed. We are now uh, moving along to the design and development stage of this particular property because the goal is to rehab this property, preserve its history, tell its story and then be able to give this back to the community and create home ownership. If you go to the next slide. And one other thing in regards to this property, this property to our knowledge is the oldest standing property within the Jonathan Street community. So we really fought really hard uh, to be able to preserve this piece of unique history. And I'm excited about how things are going to move forward uh, as we develop this first project uh, and be able to move on to other things. If you'll move to the next slide. So for us as, a, as the development corporation, we have, there's several items that we want to address in this historic Jonathan Street community. As I spoke earlier in regards to Scott Guillory's expertise, uh, one of the things that we have looked towards is that this Jonathan Street community is a food desert. Uh, so that is something that we have sought uh, to find a solution for. Uh, I believe we'll be announcing a partnership within the next um, hopefully few days in regards to something that we are working towards within this community. Next slide. And also within the community, you have the Robert W. Johnson Community Center, you have the MLK building, which was uh, the North Street School, the school for African Americans. Um, you have the cabin that we've talked about. We have American Hall. We have all these places with significant and great history uh, that we look at as educational resources for the community uh, with programming and different things that we would like to do. Uh, but it's important for us to, to preserve uh, and, and help, you know, uh, keep these uh, rich artifacts and buildings within the community and being able to tell their story uh, for generations to come. If you go to the next slide. And then the next slide, what you're gonna see is potential green space and commercial development. Uh, something that I have not alluded to when you start to think about the Jonathan Street community is 
the Jonathan Street community was an entrepreneurial community with many businesses within this community. And unfortunately, over the years, this, this community has been rezoned so that it's only residential. And currently today, there are no businesses that are here within this community. And we believe that entrepreneurship is the way back to revitalizing this community and also um, helping uh, to be able to, um, to bring prosperity to this community and those that live there. So if you'll go to the last slide. So we're here to be the change. We want to be the change that we see in our community, and we are excited about uh, what we've accomplished thus far. We're excited about the cabin project actually being started. Um, we are grateful for the funding that we received thus far. Uh, our state senator, Senator Andrew Serafini, was able to get us funding in the state budget uh, for 250000 That's going to lend its hand to finishing this first project. And we're looking to increasing that relationship and being able to move forward in regards to rebuilding this community. So thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Reggie. And thank you so much, Chanel. And um, thank you to everyone who was able to join us. Um, we are just about at the end of our time for the webinar, uh, but we really, really appreciate so much Chanel and Reggie joining us today. Um, to share all this fantastic information about their projects. And I do encourage you uh, to visit the commission's website, um, visit the Banneker Douglas website, and uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email um, with links, including a link to seeing um, where we got that commission hearing mentioned, um, and, and as well as some more information about the Dolphin Street project, um, information about the commission, information about the Dick Banneker Douglas Mu uh, Museum. So, uh, keep an eye out for that email, um, and we'll also have some other resources related to the content you saw today. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and um, we hope to see you on July 20th for our next summit session. And thank you again to all of you for joining, and thank you, Chanel and Reggie, for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Jessica. It, you, you've been a joy to work with, Reggie. Loved your presentation, and July 20th is my birthday, <laughs> so, uh, so I may not join that one, but um, but thank you. Well, you can see it afterwards if you're interested. So. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you again to everybody, and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.